web 3 expression inclusion what the internet really should have been in the first place investing i would say responsibility backing the most ambitious ideas and founders in my view who are building this web 3 future nfts key to the metaverse the the building blocks of the new creators economy woodstock fund hopefully someone who sets in their web3 venture capital story on a global stage probably a movement uh, that is unstoppable jagannath your partnership so i would say yin and yang the best complementary skill set that you can hope for when you look for a co-founder brilliant woodstock fund on very strong shoulders that's why you guys both of you are such uh, first investors from india in this space i must say brilliant pitch are in metaverse and 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 we are talking web3 and you guys are the first investors in this space i know and we've heard of bootstock fund why don't you you know vcs and investors always get startups and 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 young people to uh, pitch this is a new world you guys are creating the new world pitch to us what is bootstock fund and what are you doing there thank you so much shada for having us here um So very simply put, uh, Woodstock is a venture capital fund which invests only in Web three companies. And the idea behind investing only in Web three is to create what we call a more equitable future, right? And what we saw when we started in the space was a huge gap and sort of you know uh, a desire that we had within us that uh, why is India, especially on the venture capital side, you know, missing out on on this grand Web three story, right? And we'll have a lot of good builders developers who are building some great products in the space but back in early 2019 when we started you know we could not find any serious venture capital firm taking this uh, web3 space seriously right and that seemed pretty clear to us that you know this we are going in a direction where india is going to miss out at least on uh, creating a, a a good thought leadership on the venture capital side of how this space works and you know what are the right things to look out for when it comes to responsible investing in the space right so that i think it started as more of a personal pain problem in terms of we really want to work with the best web3 founders etc and at the same time how how do we create this and fill in this vacuum that is you know being formed in india where people are really confused and not understanding what is happening in web3 why web3 matters and what is the most responsible way to make investments in the space right so that's when we started on the journey and you know we're trying to build this what we call this east to west corridor on how we take the best teams and founders from india help them leverage the global network that we have built and how do we back some of the best global teams and founders and help them leverage the massive consumer market that exists in india and asia right so that's the journey we are on um, you know working trying to work with the best founders uh, especially a lot of love and focus towards india for sure and right now even right now we have around 35 40% of our portfolio companies which have at least one indian co-founders right so that's something that's very close to our heart and something that we plan to build very strongly on even in the coming years so yeah that's briefly about us i'll let pranav chime in about what we are as a fund you know pranav you have to up the game <laughs> he might you have said everything <laughs> yeah yeah he 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 did steal my script so <laughs> so, so let me see if i let go pressure on my shoulders uh, so so shraddha i think uh, another way to put at this is that india is at a tipping point and india's journey in web 3.0 and in many ways to become a trend related dollar economy is inevitable i keep on telling people that uh, this decade belongs to india and this decade also belongs to indians right the second point is that uh, for capturing this uh, value it is very important that you know a lot of us you know rise to the occasion yeah. and as woodstock we have uh, risen to the occasion in web 3.0 and we have created that in a formidable presence wherein let's say everyone who operates in web 3.0 knows that it's not even about we exist but we are the good actors in which is you know who are out there 
and who are in it for the long term to create that impact. It is not only financial impact, but it is also about commitment to the ecosystem and commitment to creating re responsible uh, utilization of technology and engaging very closely with the stakeholders so that India as a whole, or let's see even wherever we can contribute, the world itself becomes future ready as much as possible. So my, I would say, uh, point here, let's say to be shared, of course, Himanshu covered the founders, let me speak to the investors here, right? Is, is that if you are seeking a very authentic, committed team, which is going to stick their neck out no matter what for the long term, then uh, we are there. And we are happy to like, you know, work very closely with you uh, in that journey. You are a fund, uh, definitely, uh, whether you are investing with us, whether you are investing in us, we are extremely open to that journey as well. Uh, whether you are uh, institutional investors and you are just understanding that what is this space about? Is it, you know, it, it is so chaotic. Does it even make sense? Please reach out to us. We are here to like uh, have a conversation with you, demystify uh, the space and, you know, uh, make many possibilities for you to embrace this opportunity at the right time. Because this is about uh, globalization of Web 3.0. This is about that, you know, how as a humanity we can participate rather than majority of the chunk of the humanity becoming consumers of Web 3.0. Uh, how a lot of us can become builders, a lot of us can become enablers, and of course, consumers in the process. I'm saying this very clearly that you're putting a lot of expectation. Uh, we are all going to be following Woodstock. I hope it goes on to create that kind of a movement and phenomena when it comes to Web3 and the world that now we are living and entering. Uh, brings me to my next question. And I want to ask both of you, Imanchu, you, Pranav, that you know, technology, and of course, we're talking about Web3, blockchain, blah, blah, but the core of it is that Web1 happened, Web2 happened, and we as humans, the life that we were living in many fundamental ways changed. And, and I want you today to address that with Web3, right? Of course, there'll be advancements, and, 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 and but at the core of it as humans, as people, what is going to change and if something is going to change um and i think a lot will change because web 2 opened up a lot of possibilities when i when it comes to information but what it did was essentially did not live up to the promise of the internet right it changed the users and turned them into products right we use a lot of these free services uh, and the biggest of the web two companies today and it seems like it's all free to use but at the end of the day you are the product right they are essentially monetizing your privacy your data and uh, you know probably making mil billions of dollars on top of that right so web3 has this promise to change that and what the real essence of the internet is uh, and what we miss there to now change the users from products back to the stakeholders in the ecosystem, right? So instead of you being a product compromising on your privacy and data, all of that uh, falls back in your control and you get to participate in the Web3 products in these networks, protocols as stakeholders, right? Which is going to be a huge change and which essentially I think is the true promise of the internet on what it should have been in the first place, right? And uh, I think that will that's a much desired change at this stage, given what we have seen, especially over the last years in terms of, you know, the massive data monopolies that have been built and the amount of power that those data monopolies yield over the world today, right? So that I think will be a very good change to give those, give that power of the data and of being the stakeholders in the network back to the users. It's basically, there are three aspects, you know, one is that, uh... You can play the role of a consumer, as Himanshu was mentioning, and you have very limited elbow room to participate. Uh, the second is you can play the role of an enabler. Now, the incumbency effect in uh, traditional uh, startups and even in traditional enterprises is huge. So your ability to enable larger systems is very limited. You know, you are basically a small pawn in the larger game that happens. And the third aspect is build. Now, let's say if you want to build, then how many more you know, startups can you build in Web 2.0? How many more lending platforms you require? How many more food delivery platforms you require, etc.? So just if you look at it from a theoretical perspective, it creates an open canvas for, uh, from an economic standpoint, from a technology standpoint, wherein you can choose between the three. And, and you can play a role based upon your capacity, your capability, and your inclination, and your own aspirations, how you want to build it, how you want to you know, chart out your own personal journey forward. So this itself is so empowering 
Yeah. Uh, not, and this is not only for uh, you as you know somebody who has experienced consumption, as largely the world has been based on consumption economy over a span of time, but you also as somebody who is a co-creator of the future uh, of you know the humanity, if I may put it uh, more philosophically. Uh, then you know you have the tools and you have the mechanisms to do this. So as Himanshu mentioned, this is a journey, you know, in some ways. This is not that. Now there'll be critics. They will say that you know this is a lot more centralized, etc. But the point is that this is the power of this technology and this movement. And essentially, this is where the humanity and all of us are heading. And uh, and this is where the end state would be. Tell us what are the opportunities? What are the uh, the businesses, what are some of the ideas that you guys are backing and, and looking at? So we, we invest typically in pretty much the entire stack, what we call of the blockchain or the Web3 and how it's shaping up. And whether you know you start from the bottom most layer one protocols like Ethereum, Elrond, Casper Labs, et cetera, and how you go up from that to the middleware layer solutions. And there are your, you know, your indexing solutions, your Oracle solutions, privacy solutions, the layers that sit on top of layer one protocols. And then finally across the application stack, right? Where you have decentralized finance, DeFi, NFTs, non-fungible tokens, gaming, uh, and all these categories that fit in, right? So we invest pretty much to the entire stack across any product and service that is being built to support this new stack of Web 3.0. And within that, uh, we invest across both equity on and on the token side, right? Uh, but at one advice I would say for the entrepreneurs that are building products in this space is a lot of them tend to start rushing into building a product uh, and especially on the token side we have seen there seems to be a rush to you know image have a have a token without really taking the time to think about why you need a token in that network or the protocol right so it's very important to really think about it and get that right because once you start and if you take a decision either way of you know additional equity revenue route or through creating a token which can eventually have some utility and be a part of a network of a protocol it, it's very difficult to pivot and come back so it's it's important for them to really understand the nuances around why they should go the equity route or why they should potentially go for the token route in the space and what are the basically the roadmap that they are going to chart out and it's always completely fine unless you are sure it's always recommended and we you know talk to so many entrepreneurs and give them this advice if you are not sure about it just go the traditional equity route for now take your time build a product build a mvp get the users etc and once you get to a certain stage you can always keep thinking and reiterating right on the product and service you are building and whether it makes sense to have any kind of token utilities and within that you have you know different models there where you can have a native token of a network or a protocol you can even incentivize users through discount token mechanisms etc so there are lots of things to learn there so one advice would be not to rush into that decision it's always good to take time talk to the stakeholders talk to the people in the ecosystem to really get that that part of you know your initial journey right so one is a stack we are looking at how we are investing and this is this is something that really and un people understand well because fundamentally the technology stack has to become scalable and institutional grade for the action to shift to the application grade, right so so this is where we are focused on but the other way of also looking at this is that if web3 is a core and this is expanding then there are fringes so as a fund we always look at you know very thesis driven deep thesis driven approach in terms of where are the fringes and what are the opportunities that will lie in the fringes, which will eventually converge into Web 3.0, right? So essentially, uh, so this is another thing that really keeps us, if I may say, uh, alert or let's say, you know, uh, awake uh, in many ways. Because in many ways, we also see that, you know, there are a lot of things which are happening. For example, let's say gaming uh, happened as a fringe, but sort of, you know, uh, became integrated Web 3.0. Uh, something similar is happening right now early science is web 2.0 mm -hmm. web 3.0 and when i say web 2.0 it basically means fintech consumer tech supply chain etc a lot of convergence is happening there there's a lot of at some point there'll also be convergence with other emerging technologies so we keep on evaluating that what is the worldview that will emerge and that is the that is the way we have like a very expansive and very detailed thesis to look at you know things like these and uh, i just wanted to highlight this, this point you, Imanshu, both of you are young. 
you know investors and and if i may say so at least in my knowledge first investors from india who have a who has a fund and and investing in web3 and and to me i would say you guys as investors would be category creators and 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 first uh uh, you know, making that bet and 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 creating this fund. Tell me, what got you to look at it, and why are the traditional VCs still not uh, active or present in this space? One thing is when we started this journey in 2019, uh, it was a deep bear market. So I think one thing which will which will give you a pat on our back is that you know it was it has been a journey of massive conviction, and wherein nobody wanted to touch in a Web 3.0. So in in our uh, I think anybody who is investing in this space or anybody who is I'm seeing globally as well or any founder who is in India they clearly see that these will be the last man standing in Web 3.0. Uh -huh. So I think you know in many ways that you know puts a lot of responsibility on our shoulders. It gives us opportunities, of course, in many ways which are like materialistic opportunities, responsibilities to a little bit of a power to influence and definitely a possibility to uh, create space for many applications to uh, scale grow etc but in many ways it also you know creates a massive uh, space you know for us to uh, also contribute to the ecosystem so we have been engaging actively with various web2 funds and uh, just to highlight the the strengths that they have is they have extremely mature systems and processes they have the advantage of experience and uh, legacy which really helps them to you know uh, consider a few things as reflex actions or business as usual. A lot of these things are going to come in this space as well as the space matures and many of these startups scale up. So what I'm saying here is that the twins shall meet as in Web 2, Web 3 is a lingo right now, but at some point this will be just, you know, one because essentially there's going to be one single internet because it's all about consumers uh, eventually. So the point here is that the Web 2, uh, you know, you can say funds may be aligned in a very different way right now. They may have uh, ex extensive processes, they may not have invested enough time to build a very deep thesis, uh, and they may not have the kind of network and the global network and the presence that we may have. They may also not have the deep conviction that we have since we came out of a bear market, and we are happy to go into another bear market, and we operate best when we see a bear market, actually. So uh, I think it's a matter of, you know, cycles in many ways, but all I can say is that whenever we find somebody who's a genuine contributor to Web 3.0, and is willing to stick their neck out for the founders, we respect them. And we are extremely keen to work with them. We don't label them as Web 2.0, Web 3.0. And we just look at, you know, the kind of intent and the kind of uh, uh, perspective and the kind of background and the intention they come from. You know, Pranav and Himanshu, you know, one has to call out and say that with Woodstock Fund, what you are displaying is your deep conviction. Uh, uh, as you rightly said, about the space, about what is the possibility, what is the future, uh, and and what is to be, and and then of course there are two sides to everything, and and the world is still divided between uh, the potential of Web three and 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 the skepticism around Web three. I want you today to tell all of us through this metaverse summit, what are the two three underlying things that makes you extremely deeply convinced about the potential, the possibilities of Web3. I think very exciting about the space is just how deeply integrated the Web3 stack is, right? Uh, so we always discuss this, you know, internally and with other stakeholders as well. When it comes to Web2, the stack was very fragmented, right? There was no way to capture value at the underlying protocol layers of your HTTP, IPS, etc. And the entire value got captured at the application layer. Um, and what is happening in Web3 is your entire stack is capturing values, right? From your bottom most layer settlement layers, like your layer one protocols, which we discussed, Ethereum, etc. And that creates a very strong fly flywheel effect, right? Because your underlying layers first mature to support the application layer. They capture a lot of value. They become secure to handle the all the transaction volume that, and value that is going to sit on top of them. And once uh, people see that happening, that attracts the developers to build on top of that layer because they know that their applications are going to be secure because the, the underlying layer has captured enough value uh, already, right? So that happens and that creates sort of this flywheel effect to the middleware layers and to the application layers. So the value flows to them. And again, that's, you know, flows back to your underlying layers because if you attract more developers, if you build more applications on top of a particular protocol, then eventually people 
see that this uh, protocol is actually capturing a lot of you know new web3 applications and eventually a lot of users are going to be using the underlying protocol so that attracts further value in, into your underlying protocols right so this network effect and this flywheel is very very strong in this space which is why we also see these mini cycles within the space right where we see a particular category uh, capture a lot of value and eventually it starts flowing across to other different categories etc right and uh, i think we are going to continue to see that happen over the next 5 10 years um, till you know your underlying layers reach a, a good level of value captured uh, with them as so probably like you know in hundreds of billions of dollars so they are very secure right so it becomes very uh, difficult to carry out your 51 percent 67 percent network effects on your underlying layers because you need probably hundreds of billions of dollars to take out uh, carry on those attacks right and that once that happens then we'll start seeing a lot of value being abstracted towards the application layer right where you know key or underlying layers are secure so now you can have an application which can you know reach out to a billion users without having to worry about uh, any of the security aspects of it so that natural i would say flywheel of value capture combined with the network effects that web3 brings when it makes you know all the users stakeholders in the networks and essentially if you are a stakeholder you are going to become a voice and an ambassador of the network right which doesn't happen in web2 usually because you are restricted to a certain very limited set of investors till you hit the ipo right and only then people can you know participate in your company the success of your company after it has just hit the ipo stage that happens very quickly in web3 world right you can participate through different channels across even private sales and even public sales happen very very quickly at much lower valuations compared to the ipo valuations so you create much more stakeholders right from the beginning of the starting of your product compared to what happens in web2 world so i think that those couple of nuances are what is creating this immense excitement about this space right okay this is going to be the future because you cannot compete against increasing stakeholders in a product increasing network effects in a product and especially much more efficient business models because this layer allows you to transact p2p right peer to peer you you can find your uh, people you want to do business with directly and transfer value to them directly without any middleman so you have the network effects on one side and you have much more efficient business models you are creating on the other side by removing all the middlemen because you can transact value directly so you know i think these are some very powerful uh, uh, ingredients to have that will you know continue to keep pushing the space forward very much you i i can make out your deeply convict Instant in that deep conviction comes out. You have one of the questions, and and uh, to both of you, uh, that in your fund, are you looking at doing it differently, or the structure follows the you know what we saw in Web two uh, uh, companies, the investment that was happening in terms of from a fund structure. Also, are you thinking differently? I think the governance is a very important piece, and that's why there's a lot of action which is happening in DAOs, etc. And uh, my own uh, personal view is here is that, you know, the governance cannot be truly decentralized because essentially a governance is an element of skill set, participation and understanding the responsibility and doing the right thing, which is also a matter of judgment, which is very amorphous in many ways. Mm -hmm. So yeah. as human beings, you know, we can't really decentralize it fully because, uh, you know, the might of the crowd is not the most, uh, you know, right thing to be done uh, many times. And at the same time, you also can't, you know, uh, leave it to artificial intelligence or machine learning over a span of time, because you need to find unique and path-breaking solutions to the problems that exist, right? If you want to solve a complex problem in the society uh, over a span of time. So, so, so the point I'm making here is that let's say when, it, when you look embed this first principle thinking to the fund structure, then you will need a space wherein the, the buck has to stop somewhere and the decision-making has to be done in a way that over years, the decision making is very consistent and you are take, take, taking care of the stakeholders across the board, whether it is investors on one side who require consistency and predictability, right? And the, on the other hand, you also require, let's say, other stakeholders, like, for example, regulators are very important stakeholders. Yeah. They require transparency of reporting and definitely the regulations also change. So you can't have like a fixed structure of doing things. You need to have a little bit of agility out there to see that how you can align with the evolving regulations. Similarly, you need to have, let's say, modular structures in a way that the various aspects like taxation, like 
people to participate their channels in which you know people want to engage more deeply with human beings so that they get validation they get comfort they get clarity like that this conversation is you know happening in some ways also is giving some pointers and insights to people who are the who is going, going to be the audience of this so i think there's going to be a spectrum it's going to be evolution but it's not going to be completely decentralized and dows at some point in time Uh, it's going to be somewhere in middle where in the fund manager and you know working very closely with the portfolio companies and having that human touch is going to be defining factor for generating uh, alpha on on longer time frames but having said that the way the whole dao structure is evolving is very powerful we're keeping a close watch on it to see that you know how we can see that we can get investors and various other stakeholders to participate uh, for the sake of you know them having a fair chance to participate uh you know in in the whole process of investing so we're keenly looking at what is it that we can automate and what is it that we can standardize and what is it that we can decentralize we look forward to that and uh, we look forward to your updates as you go along on that because somewhere when himanshu was answering uh, and 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 front of you about the web2 world that we also saw when it comes to the vc and the investor community also right that there it gets monopolized they are the big boys and then there is the rest who is going after so maybe you have a chance to change that narrative in web3 with good stock fund yeah yeah uh to both of you what are some of the opportunities and and again i'm asking this very tactically because this will keep evolving and changing but as of now someone looking in in this space building in this space what are the few areas you'll say that they should focus on or look at top of my mind category to to for you know uh, new builders in the space to look at is the simple user experience side of things because that is what i think is really really holding the space back even now and even when we talk about the governance the dao and everything right uh, i think the the major reason we have seen a lack of interest or growth on that side is just because how sheerly complicated it is right you expect the an average user uh, who even holds like let's say small percentage of the tokens in your network to actually be on top of the proposals that are coming on some hidden blog or you know channel of of your website and actually then connect your wallet in, uh, different wallets first of all that in itself is a messy user experience because people have to maintain 10 15 different wallets today for different types of networks and then you have to vote on those proposals right so i think all of that let's say has to be simplified where you just have you know on your phone a, a simple app your wallet is natively integrated there you see a, a any governance proposal as a question and you just vote yes or no right that's where it has to get to to include the governance aspect of things and similarly on the simple usability of all these applications right so i think we have to abstract a lot of that and the user experience has to be really really focused very strongly on if we now want to get from those 200 300 million whatever users we have today to 2 3 billion users right you are 200 300 million users growth you have seen from people who are So, uh, a bit tech savvy and people yeah. who understand the massive opportunity in front of them but you are never going to go from here to 2 3 billion and see a 10x growth unless you build products which are very simple to use like your web2 products right simple logins simple interfaces simple yes or no questions to participate in governance mechanisms so um, uh, it's really interesting to see probably some of the growth that we have see happen on that side and some of the teams that are building eventually now your application layer and even in the application layer simple tools to make all of this very easy for the end user side right? because i think they they stand a very good chance of capturing a lot of the eventual users right and once you capture the users there are always 10 different ways to for the grow your product pivot in different ways and figure out the monetization revenue streams etc so uh, that's you know one area that i am personally very excited about to see who's like really putting their foot down and and capturing and understanding this user experience problem and seeing uh, how to solve for that mohan sir you find me companies i have are you looking i have found companies who are actually focusing on that uh there are some good teams i think that we have come across that are starting to focus on on that and even i would say couple of 
uh, uh, you know layer one protocols that are themselves really focusing very very strongly on that aspect right uh, because a lot of times we have seen the developers especially across your bottom layers whether your layer one protocols etc they don't tend to focus too much on the user experience and they just want to build the core underlying tech and then leave it to the application layer developers to build the applications right but if you don't uh, create a very simple solutions right from the beginning. I think that that foundation is is weaker and weaker. So, and that's what we have been recommending to a lot of even our portfolio companies and the teams that we are talking to is your your team is brilliant, your tech is brilliant, the solution and the use case makes sense, but we are not seeing enough focus on the user experience side of things, right? So you actually need to think about it from that end user that you are going to capture in five years or ten years from now, rather than set of 200 million users that you might want to capture today so we are starting to see i would say some good work and focus in that direction for sure and i think probably over the next three to five years we'll will you know see some really strong mainstream applications which you know abstract a lot of that complexity and eventually get us to that stage of the next five to next growth in the industry no no thanks i'm just picking up a very interesting point about uh scale you know and 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 i think the large scale transformation will happen when user experience is simplified but let's say today we use paytm or upi in india right we don't care what sits at the back end of it we yeah. just want to use it send money easily right so eventually on the blockchain side you want to get to that experience where it doesn't matter what protocol you are using whether it's ethereum whether it's you know five other different layer ones you are just able to to send money to anyone in your friend and family and everything gets taken care of at the back end, right? Without you having to think about, I'm creating wallet on this blockchain or that blockchain and I have to ensure that yeah, I enter the value, right, et cetera. And I don't lose my private keys and my seed phrase, et cetera. So all of that needs to go away. So Shraddha, you know, besides this, I think uh, gaming and gamification, uh, I think I think uh, are areas, you know, that would uh, accelerate a lot of this uh, journey because uh, like Himanshi was saying that user experience is very important. And if you look at uh, fundamentally, the games become exciting when the user experience is superior. Otherwise, a game would, won't work out. So essentially, they're coming from deep user experience. And there is an incentive layer which is getting built. There is a phenomenal work which is happening uh, even as we speak around the infrastructure, which is you know, coming around, whether it is distribution infrastructure or whether it is uh, sharing infrastructure, guilds, etc., uh, or whether it is you know, marketplaces, whether it is even gaming studios, new gaming studios are coming. And essentially, even the existing gaming studios are building blockchain divisions. They are appointing head of blockchains, etc. cetera. So, so this massive space around gaming, uh, it is creating a phenomenal category. And essentially, what this will do is this will also seep in into the real world, which is what I am calling as gamification. So that means that this playbook around superior user experience with a superior incentive layer and an ability uh, to give uh, the power back uh, to the users, as in the economic power at least, and keep deeper immersive experiences is something that will translate to other spaces uh, over a span of time. And it, the starting point there could be NFTs, like various brands are looking at you know, NFTs right now. Uh, and practically every brand is looking at NFT, if I may sort of generalize this. But uh, over a span of time, what they're seeking essentially is, uh, NFT is almost like a key into the door. And they are looking at more immersive experience for their consumers so that their, band, their brands can become much more relatable and you know, much more, uh, I would say, they can stand out vis-a-vis -vis their competitors. So, so the gamification and gaming is something as a space which will lead this uh, massive uh, adoption. This is one aspect. Uh, the second aspect is infrastructure. So right now, if you look at uh, the world itself, US infrastructure around custody, around payment gateways, around, you know, even uh, the licensing frameworks, you look at Singapore, et cetera, it is reasonably mature, mm -hmm. right? And even if you look at, let's say, UAE, UAE is also, you know, sort of uh, in many ways, you know, uh, stretching the boundaries to see that, you know, how the best of the infrastructure can be built here on digital assets. So I think the next rush is going to be that, you know, how various economies should not be left out and they should have the necessary infrastructure in place. So extremely bullish on these regional plays around infrastructure because uh, they will be governed by current regulations, especially capital market regulations and even the capital controls which exist because of central banks. So these infrastructures will also become a dominant force in the respective countries as the regulations mature. So I just want to say that you know these are the other areas that uh, look yeah. very exciting. 
no thank you this is very very informative very useful actually uh, but pranav now you've talked about uh, geographies and 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 uae us europe now tell me uh, where i how are you guys seeing india uh, india and i'm talking from a country standpoint of course we have a lot of developers tech tech is here in bangalore everyone is excited about web3 and uh, what is happening but as a country where do you see us and, and as a country what are some of the things that we should do because this is a completely new playground which is getting created whenever somebody asks me this question my first sentence is i love india right <laughs> massive opportunity uh, which is more western reason reason I'll, i'll say but essentially somebody who was in brought born and brought up in india uh, i just you know enjoy the vibe there etc in many ways if you look at india india is a plural society you know yeah. uh, it may it may seem very chaotic to somebody who is an outsider but it is it is essentially what web 3.0 is right now <laughs> you know people can't make sense of it they they catch the tail then they miss the head they catch the head they miss the tail etc right uh, so in many ways if you look at it india is web 3.0 but socially web 3.0 yeah right? so and of course with english speaking developer base all the demographic dividend you know that we have all the tick marks that we have in in web 2.0 and narrative as well essentially all of these things you know create a very positive opportunity space uh, for india to shine now the point i mentioned uh, i think probably a conversation like on the 6 months back is is it about india shining or indians shining right and and i think this is a very important point that indians are shining in this space and every other space globally right and indians will continue to shine because they are enterprising have high, high integrity uh, and basically when they sense the opportunity they understand the responsibility extremely well and they are willing to push boundaries beyond a certain point i'm not saying that others are not i'm just since the question is specifically focused on india i'm just talking about india yeah, and we can, you can you can continue because you've already done the disclaimer you love <laughs> india so you can go on <laughs> okay okay so so here so so another thing is if this is like a tectonic movement Mm-hmm. Uh, which is happening and essentially india is going to be uh, web3 india is web3 ready and india is going to adopt web3 and definitely the early dabbling always happens in uh, finance which is where the exchanges and the cryptocurrencies and uh, captured the popular narrative but i just want to share that in this forum that uh, uh, blockchain or this entire participatory economy is not only about trading and you know uh, you know sort of uh, uh, leveraging etc and and these are the things that you know concern regulators that they if they open up the doors then what kind of you know leakages yeah. you know may seep in and what kind of uh, non visibility and lack of surveillance uh, will you know create issues in terms of you know these this is a class so i just you know want to share a perspective here is that i have spoken with you know various uh, stakeholders over a span of time and they are extremely open uh, right they are very willing to have conversations to understand Uh, that you know what are the possibilities of this technology they are very keen to find a way that they can actually have uh, you know improved surveillance if i may use that word so that you know they can find a way to sort of shape up in a way that you know the country itself doesn't a is not left out which is a narrative that most of us you know share but the other aspect is that a large part of india is still getting there in terms of the economic well being and how they don't miss out or how they don't get marginalized and this is where the regulators and the policy makers sort of you know struggle that what is the middle path where yeah. they can navigate so my angle there has been always that you know it makes complete sense that you know uh, if these are the point of views which are emerging and there are no clear solutions there are two ways one is can we have more data uh, and the data can come from either understanding what happened in us what happened in singapore and how the regulations shaped up how they started from a humble beginning and they landed up you know creating a much open system over a span of time and 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 the second point is that how we can contextualize this to indian context right and create necessary framework works for example let's say you have sandbox or you have a licensing mechanism probably in a gift city uh, wherein let's say you can have you know uh, checks and balances in place you have a set of uh, third parties which are you know and paneled so that they can you know support and participate so they there are enough and more mechanisms and one of the thing which i uh, did you know just to you know sort of you know uh, take a little bit of a responsibility on the shoulders is that can we find a way to you know have these conversations a lot more so yeah. you know sort of became part of a think tank uh, called as horizon institute uh, with you know couple of you know really talented people and the intention there is that you know can we get best of the research which is globally available 
uh, and which has what has got you know policy makers and regulators to look at this space differently to also have a perspective because ultimately the context that they have of india is something that they are more privy to and they are an experts in that space right yeah. what we can do is we can play the role of an enabler by giving them the perspective and the details and the insights and the research so that they can take relevant decisions uh, which are the right decisions for the country to progress and not to miss out on innovation and job creation on one side but also not create a situation wherein the economic well being of the masses is uh, hampered and also pranav you touched upon job creation and 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 from what it seems like looks like that uh, for a lot of our young people web3 would be a potential uh, ground for good jobs right so so this is phenomenal if you look at it it's almost like giving a toolbox or a toolkit in the hands of uh, you know a young aspiring population and creating self jobs yeah. right so this is one part the second part i just want to share is that let's say if you're aspiring money is one part of the equation but the second part is you want to solve for the most complex and contemporary problems out there that gives you the creative satisfaction that also gives you that sense of arrival and the confidence to do much more in life right yeah. it is very important to be part uh, as in a cog in the wheel because you learn processes you learn mechanisms to be part of larger systems and follow the rhythm but at some point you have to find a way that you can solve for complex problems so if i am a look at you know india and indian history so we came from a certain let's say 50 60 years of us has been a lot more about evolution and finding that economic uh, you can say stability if i may use that word and we are at a massive inflection point you know right now as a country and we have come from this uh, i would say in many ways service economy to a product economy in many ways yes. so now let's say if you now just think of this very logically if let's say products have to be built on scale you know how many web to products you know can an individual build and the kind of resistance that a startup faces in terms of building a very scalable enterprise in web to space now imagine now cut this to let's say web 3.0 let's say if you have the toolbox and if you are somebody who has the intention the acumen and the ability to garner resources to build world class product there's something interesting i want to ask you know when it comes to in the web to the big tech giants right like at least last 15 20 years we kept on hearing the big for the big tech ye matlab ye hai aur wahan pe hai and innovation is silicon valley everything is there do you think that in web 3 as as of today the the ground is open for anyone from anywhere to create massive uh, uh, scale and and narrative and story and in you know and 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 business yeah sure that it is open and my argument here is it will always be open and 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 the reason i'm saying this is because uh, the number of permutations and combinations of technologies and the application is infinite let's say elon musk is looking at putting uh, let's say i'm just saying you know uh, um, uh, let's say man on the mars right then phenomenally let's say if the how mars and india uh, let's say so, sorry the world is going to sort of you know cooperate or let's say you know exchange is going to be fundamentally through a technology link a network right so the application will also be required for us to operate on mars so the reason i'm saying this mars and earth you know kind of a context is not to like create a very philosophical kind of a stretch imagination but just to share that as we uh, land up solving for simple problems like lending borrowing exchange and uh, sort of you know things like uh, middle components we will land up you know and then gaming and incentivizing gaming etc we will not stop there as humanity we will start uh, land up focusing on more more complex problems and we will land up you know uh, creating collaborative infrastructure for solving for things on scale you know so what i'm trying to say here is that web3 is a phenomenal evolutionary journey so a definitely there's a huge headroom whether it is a regional play whether it is a global play there's a huge headroom and there's always going to be headroom for somebody to participate in web3.0 uh, thank you so much pranav thank you so much himanshu this was a brilliant conversation and i'm sure everyone has taken a lot uh, uh, from this uh, just a very quick hygiene check if people want to reach out to you if they want to connect what's the best way so we have a contact page on our website and on linkedin uh, we are very easily accessible so we try to stay on top of things there so i think those probably would be the best channels